Okay, so where was I? Uh, making up these uh, Gillow plastic parts. Um, so in this case, you've got you've got a three-piece uh, setup that makes the um, what is this thousand pounder? I never did look it up. I think either I don't know five hundred thousand pounders. I have to check. Either five hundred or one thousand pound bombs. Uh, probably doesn't make much sense that. Let's see, this might tell us. Uh, I think this is focusing on the rockets. Uh, <clears throat> so these are the rocket tubes I was talking about. I'm thinking about uh, putting those on the airplane along with the uh, bombs attached to the hard points. And uh, so uh, that's only talking about rockets and not talking about the bomb size. Okay, that's a fuel tank being added to the wing pylon. Now, now, much information. That looks like a thousand pounder. Or a cluster bomb container. Huh. Caliber ammunition, the guns, two other personnel move a bomb under the left wing pylon. Alright, so no, it's not a cluster bomb. Okay. Long before, okay, World War II fought long before cluster bombs were developed. However, cluster bombs were used during the war that consisted of small bombs bounded together in a fairly large, oh yeah, like this. <coughs> Man's tenacity when it comes to making weapons of war. Probably underestimated, undervalued. No, I don't know what I'm trying to say. All I'm saying is this is a this is a, this is a warbird, right? So it's going to have stuff on it, and uh, it's, I'm going to make that stuff. Here's a good close-up of a wing pylon. So a couple of features on here. Obviously, it's got the kickers, and then it's got this center rail uh, part here. And uh, so I need to add those and make these pylons look more like the photograph. What I've got so far is this, which is a nice blank, um, but I need to go from this to this, right? So I'm thinking of using a couple of lengths of um, just flat wire, flat, uh, what have I got? Strips of aluminum. And then what we'll do is add little wire, drill drill out the ends, add these wire uh, bomb connectors, for lack of a proper word. And then I'll uh, down the center here. We'll add just a sh strip of uh, sheet metal. Uh, just cut apart a coke can or something probably for that. Drive that into that uh, part there, and then we'll slot. Uh, the top of the bomb, <coughs> run a slot across the top that'll fit up in there. Anyway, uh, what I was talking about here was the rocket tubes, you know, when I go to finish the wings and what kind of a bomb load or weapon load this airplane's going to carry, it'll probably include that. Okay, so let's see if we have a photograph here of a fully loaded. P-47. I was going to do it in such a way that the, all of the armament could be removed as I <clears throat> transition between my ability to accept weapons of war and the stuff that we did do to each other and those periods of time when I don't. <laughs> and I could just pull all the, all the killing stuff off of it and just have the airplane hang there. Or sit on the shelf there unarmed and um, so that's <clears throat> these are my thoughts so the way I wanted to attach these to the airplane I don't think I'm gonna be gluing them up I, I might still but I might not and the way I would do it is if I'm not gonna glue it up is to drill a few holes in two holes into uh, the underwing surface insert plastic uh, tubing of a certain diameter and then with that 
I would then drill these out to correspond to those holes and drop in wire of a diameter that fits snugly into uh, the plastic tubing so that they can be inserted and removed. Same with the bombs. Um, that center line strip of metal and the slot in the top of the uh, bomb itself um, would have a friction fit so that I could pull those off, leave the pylons on or pull bomb and pylons off. You know, it's just, for me, it's just the, the challenge of, okay, you know, can I come up with a way, a plan for the versatility and then pull it off. <clears throat> Looking at the uh, airplane now, you can see uh, working on the tail here and the fairings. So the way this works, I put the uh, sauce on here. The uh, it's just a, a combination of uh, filler and water, uh, spack and water. So you just you know wet your wet, put some spackle on the uh, spatula, or wet it, drop it, dip it in the water for a second, and then mix it into a kind of a toothpaste. Um, the stuff comes out of here. It's pretty thick, but when you work it with just a drop of water, you get something about the consistency of toothpaste, which is what you want and then you just rub that in with your fingers into the wood grain and that's how I you know after like three or four applications where I put the stuff on let it dry and sand it off put the stuff on let's say three times I go through that wash rinse repeat um, you know by the third or fourth time the wood grain is you know, essentially you know vanished it's gone it's filled and uh, and that's what we're going for so and then once I get these surfaces right, I'm going to come back and um, make out of filler the fairings. So, uh, let's see if I can find a catalog. <coughs> what am I talking about? Okay. That's an N. I don't have an N. No dorsal. Well, I'll use this illustration anyway. I'm not, I'm not necessarily putting the extended dorsal on that the D40 and the D, some of the D25 NAs were retrofitted with. But you can see around the tail is this fairing. And it's not just a panel line here, it actually represents uh, the fairing itself. So I would take uh, tape and just mask it off to, to match this line across the top. And then across the top of the, um, here, across the top of the, vertical stabilizer here uh, where is it we want to draw in this line here so with tape that means I'm going to run a line tight to the stern of it pull it outward angle it outward to the footing here the footing of the stabilizer so you see how it sweeps in towards the tail there and then that line is that's that's the fairing for the tail. So we're going to kind of replicate that and then smooth it into uh, the airplane. And you just mask it off with tape as if you were painting, but you're using filler instead of paint. And then sanding it um, with a roll of sandpaper. Sometimes I wrap, you know, short length of the, uh, what is this? 120 grit, 180 grit sometimes wrap it around something of a suitable diameter and then just use that to scoop sand it into that into the trough shape that the uh, that the fairing has and you're left with that delineation when you pull the tape you've got that delineation as if it were a, a piece uh, a part instead of just you know, filler if that makes sense so <clears throat> these are the things we're doing uh, I wanted to talk about the way I do these parts again. So cylindrical parts, round parts, parts made up of two equal pieces like the tank is. Uh, I put, I take the um, strip stock, uh, sheet stock that I have and just cut, basically just trace around the part like, like so, whatever it is, whether it's oblong or circular. And you just use a marker or a pencil or what have you or trace around it cut it out and sand it until it fits just inside with a with a block sander 
sand the piece of wood until it fits just inside of the plastic components that you're gluing together. And in this case, there's two pieces of 3 30 seconds, one in each. And that makes it easier for two, uh, two reasons, uh, two ways. One, it makes it e easier to glue the parts to align them and glue them together. And then obviously it makes a much stronger bond here so that the part that's, that seam won't split just from squeezing the part. Sometimes when you're handling these, you know, you're applying pressure to them, you're sanding this seam down. I haven't sanded the seam edge yet. But that's the other thing it does. Now I can sand this right down to the bone. And then when I use the filler and, and slant sand across that, it'll, it'll be a smooth, so, um, it would be a smooth, seamless feature. Now, the belly tanks were two-part. They were welded together tanks like this. They were not one piece of aluminum. So they did have a seam running around here. So what I'll end up probably doing in this case is just sanding this down a little bit, making it less pronounced, but not disappear it entirely. And then, um, <clears throat> you know, see how that looks. If it doesn't look right, I can sand it completely off and just take a strip of uh, evergreen plastic and, uh, and just run that around um, the equator there until we have a more decent looking seam. So again, back to these parts. So, you know, we got the, uh, I labeled these two, B and L. B is the larger uh, dimple and L is the little dimple. And that, because these are not identical in diameter, so you, you want to make sure you're putting the right part into the right one. At least getting closer to the correct size when you cut them out. And I cut them out just like I would do the plastic part. I, I'm not really pulling the knife, I'm turning the part and just leaving the, the tip located on the line. Putting some pressure but not much. And this is a better way to draw, you know, s shapes that are not a straight line. Obviously with a straight line you just lay down the ruler and cut. But when you have curves, it's better to do it this way. And then the only place where you're really cutting is where the uh, grain goes across the, uh, the line that you're drawing to, like that one. All right, and uh, we just block sand it. Oh, the sandpaper shot. Let me go with this one. So it's stiff enough that I don't necessarily need to use a block. And I just want to go around, you know, paying attention to keeping the part round, sanding just inside of, you know, just past the line. And just maintaining that circular, smooth, circular shape. And there'll be high spots and, and low spots, and you'll see them. And you just keep working around, working around. Test fit it a couple of times, see how you're doing. And see if you're keeping it round. So this is again the B1. So it goes here. And we're still just a little bit oversized. And then you just, like I said, just keep working it around. And eventually it'll be of a size that's uh, a good fit. Like we're getting close. So let's take a look again. Yeah, see, we're almost there. So a better way to check it is to set the part down and use the use your work surface. Kind of press it in that way. Looks like looks like it's still oversized. Yeah, we gotta keep working it a little bit. Gotta keep working it. So, you know, again, this hobby, the way I do this or whatever. What I what I do here, whatever it is I'm doing here, um, it's not for everybody, right? And I've had people ask me, you know, why are you doing all of that? And uh, I don't have a good answer, you know. Is there, you know, maybe I'm on the spectrum? Who knows? I think everybody is on some spectrum or another. You know, there's no. There's no perfect person. There's no undented cans out there running around in the world. If there are, I mean, good luck to them. But uh, for the rest of us, you know, we got to find ways to 
to make things uh, work. You know, I got a, I got a good life, right? I got my grandkids here, my wife. We've been married for a while. I should say a good while. The whole time's been a good, been a good thing. All right, so there we use the desktop to kind of make sure we get a, a flat fit. It's still just a little bit oversized. I could see that it was pushing out the edges on the uh, on the part a little bit on the bomb on the killing device. So anyway, here let's see. Yeah, and that that's how you get them in there. So the next step, obviously is to add some adhesive and I'm just going to draw a bead around the inside of this not much it's super glue which means it's you know super and uh, I'm just going to drop it right back on top of the part just like that nice and flat I don't know if you can see this I got the camera pointed strangely and oddly I, I bet I've just been talking and you haven't really seen the damn thing I've done so we got the part cut out we got the the glue in there, we got it sanded to size, and in she goes. Nice and flat. So we'll do the other one. Same process, we've already traced out the part. We're just going to draw a line. And it's probably time for a new blade, but I'm going to soldier on and get through this one. You go through blades pretty quick. They don't make them like they used to. You know, these blades get dull in a heartbeat. I mean, I'm just cutting balsa wood here, and I probably have to change a blade. If I were to be just sitting here making this, th these parts, I wouldn't get through more than five or six of them before I noticed it. And then I'd probably only be able to do another five or six with the blade in that condition before I started. It was before it was just ripping uh, the balsa wood and not cutting it. So that's that's what I'm talking about. And back in the day, you buy these blades. Well, I snapped that one, didn't I? All right, we're just gonna stick it back together. I don't, I, I don't like wasting a lot of wood. I mean, I could just, you know, why don't you, why don't you just make another part? Yeah, I do that all day long. You have no idea. I, I don't have this camera on very often, but I'm pretty much back here snapping parts all day. <laughs> 